Very good. So happy Sabbath, everyone. I am excited to be here with you guys. And thank you for the opportunity again to come and visit you. Um, I know we just prayed, but before we continue, I would like to pray one more time. Let's have our eyes. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of being your children and being able to worship you in this place. Father, we ask that your presence would be here with us. Your Holy Spirit would um, enlighten our hearts and minds. And I pray that you would use me today, Father, that I may be um, an instrument in your hands and nothing else. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I think you probably, probably got some things to know I'm here to speak about. Um, the time I've spent in this room in the past few years. I think some of you obviously know me very well, some of you don't know me very well at all. But we will get to know each other better. Yes. Um, so I, um, yeah, so I've been in group for the last two years as a missionary. But before that, today I want to start not just with that, but rather looking back on what God has done over the course of my life. Because I remember the child I thought, you, you know, you hear these testimonies of people who can tell us how they lived a life in, in the world and how God saved them from addictions or crime or the prison or whatever, and they came to God Jesus. And I thought, wow, those are really cool, incredible story. I don't think I'll ever hear a story like that. Every single one of us has a testimony. It doesn't matter where we come from. And as I look back on, especially now, as I look back on my life, it's incredible, and it makes me so excited to see what God has done and is doing in my life. And so, I want to take you guys with me on that journey today to see a little bit of what God has done in my life, and also to look together in the future to see what God has in store for the lives of each one of us. Um, so, just backing up a little bit, um, I've lived here most of my life, and I've grown up in this Adventist church, and um, as I look back, on over the years, there are several things that stand out in my mind as things that planted in my heart a desire to, to work for God in, in mission service. And some of those things were like the, the mission trips that I went on with my family, my church family over the years. Also, going to Young Disciple Camp, um, always super inspiring. And then also things like other, other youth activities and things like that. And one of the biggest things, and Parents and young children to know the stories that my mother read me as a child. She read us lots and lots of books, and we learned lots of things. We learned about uh, like the great scientists and things like that, which that was our history and science and all sorts of things. But she also read us lots of mission stories. And the more mission stories I heard, the more I thought, wow, I think I want to be a missionary someday. And I remember specifically one story my mom read me about the missionary Clyde Peters. Have you guys heard of Clyde Peters? He was a missionary in, I think it was kind of like in the 1960s, to, to Peru, to the upper Amazon basin, the, the jungles. And he was a pilot. And he would go in doing, I think his wife was a nurse or something, they would fly to remote places and, and provide medical service and preaching the gospel to, to people. They were pirated missionaries. And these jungle places. And when I heard that story, I thought, wow, that is, I want to do that when I grow up. And I know, like, for a little kid, I don't know all little kids in this way, but I know when we were little, we'd always go, what are you going to do when you grow up? And it's like, I'm going to be a missionary bush pilot. And I was excited about that. And as time went on, I started to think a little more seriously about it. Like, okay, so we can get excited and inspired by hearing these incredible stories, but Let's, let's look at the reality, because if you're really a missionary, that doesn't mean that every day is just a series of incredible miracles. You're like, wow, wow. Like, there's a lot of mundane days in between. There's lots of missionaries who died before they ever see the results of what they've done. That's what it really is like. And also, not everyone's called to a foreign land and they places. So where might God be calling me? The other thing I realized, if I was to be a missionary, it meant to be behind my family, in my home, and the things that were most precious to me. And that was like, as a little child, that was like a super scary thought. And it's not just about going someplace else, like, you know, we all grow up and 
blue value, you can get a class of house across town, you can go to another state, you can do things. We're talking about going a long ways away and maybe never coming back. You don't know what's going to happen if that will happen. I don't know about that. And well, I thought, well, I'm, I'm still a little kid, so I've got time. I guess God will show me in time what he wants me to do. But I, and so in a way, I, I was like, okay, deferred decision, right? But I see now that God, through that time, the one thing that I always desired more than anything was I knew I wanted to do God's will, whatever that meant. And so as the years went by, I continued growing up and went to school here at WBC. And I absolutely loved it. Love, love, love school. Especially when I started taking the science classes and physics and math. I love math. And like my other fellow students are like, oh, physics love. This is boring. And like my lab partner sitting there and stuff like that. And I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Super excited about it. And I was like, especially like math calculus, applied math. I'm like, this is so cool. And I thought, well, you know, I think I want to be. I think I want to be a side math changer and teach math, like at a college level. Like that. So that became my my goal. And when I was headed that direction, I applied for university. I was accepted, lots of things, but I wasn't 100 percent sure. So I realized this is a big step. This is a lot of money, a lot of time. When I get done, what if I decide this wasn't the right option? So I thought, well, I only have one to be a missionary. Maybe I'll take a year. And go as a missionary for a year and see what God, how He meets me. And after that, maybe my vision will focus a little better on what I should do. So I started looking into where to go. I didn't really know where to go. And I can tell you stories for a super long time about all this. So I don't think you all want to be able to talk this afternoon. So I'll try to make that short. Anyway, so I ended up going to move training school, which is a missionary training school in Belize, where they teach you. In three months, they give you like stuff that everything down your basically about how to be missionaries. So, everything from agriculture to survival to medical to teaching to Bible studies and preaching and auto mechanics and everything. So, I went there, but it's three months of um, study, and then you have to go for six months of service to the place of your choice. And that's what here we are. Um, while I was there, I learned about a project in Peru, and through another series of obvious God leading me there, he indicated that that's where I would go for my six months. So here's Peru, just to focus in on our map. Um, where I would be, you can see the little yellow thing here? Um, so that, that big river there is the, the Ucayali River that leads down to the Amazon. The Ucayali River is one of the main tributaries to the Amazon River. And the place where I'd be going is just a little bit down the river of, of there is a city called Pucalpa. And it's a it's a city on the river there. And but then all up and down that huge river are native communities of different tribes. Um, especially in the region where I was, there were Shipibos and Ashanikas, which that is why I dressed this way today, because this is what they were in the Ashanika villages where I where I worked and lived. Um, so I'd be going there, here's a map a little closer to Kukalpa, and then up river there's the villages where I was working. That's about a, uh, like an 18 hour on boat up to those villages. Um, so I ended up going with another girl that was another student from there. She and I would be missionary partners. And then these are two other guys that were going with us. They were like, our, they were like staff at the school we were And they were also going there to, to work. And this is the um, project is the, the missionary base in Kukalpa, where we would be staying. So um, it was a little bit of a, I still had a lot of <laughs> the things that God was planning to do with me as I went along my way. So I, I got to there, and I honestly, I really didn't know that much about what I was going to be doing. I knew I was going to be doing pioneer missionary work in the jungle. And like church planting. I'm like, okay, that sounds great. And we were going the four of us, so it's like, okay, we'll be we'll be good, like, you know, I grew. I get there and I, I, I imagine, okay, so we're here in Kukalpa at our base, and then we'll like pack our backpacks for a week and go out to some villages and be working there, and we'll come back to our base, right? Sounds like a good deal. So 
So I get there and then they're like, yeah, it's going to flood you like a month at a time when you're going out. Like, okay, a month, that's fine. And then I, I kind of was taken by surprise. I didn't realize that there was actually a whole bunch of other people who were going to do this. And there's other Peruvian um, missionaries too that were going to be going out. There were several of us. And, um, so we're sitting down and receiving our training to go out the next week. And they're like, okay, so the first date that we'll have you guys all back here at the base will be in June. It's June. Oh, it's six months. Okay, well that's a little different. And they're like, so we'll put you, since you girls, we're gonna put you girls in a village that's, that's nearby to the two, the two guys that have come with you. And I'm like, okay. I'm thinking like, maybe something like, Kashmir to ride it or something. I don't know, you know, something close by, right? They're like, it'll just be six hours by boat.
what life is like. That's not what, that's not what defines your experience there. And so, um, I guess, I, I mean, I did learn lots of things. Like, I used to sing snakes sometimes and having huge spiders in the around my house. I was like, oh, okay. And um, I learned to eat, like, the native food, what they eat. And, and I actually created so much now that American food which is really tough to deal with. And I learned to sleep on the floor, and I learned mosquito net. My mattress now gives me terrible back and I don't to do about it. And I feel insecure outside of the mosquito net. And we got, we used to get on a little boat. We built a boat with a native guy and have a pecking motor. It's like this, this little motor. I don't know, it looks like a lot. I don't know it's But that's how they navigate everyone. We boat some boats and um, we learned to tell time by the, what, when the airplanes fly over. And you know, we learned to go fishing at night, day, and mine never got very good with my, my aims. Um, but we cooked over an open fire, we mowed the grass with machetes, we washed and bathed in the river, we, your clothes don't have to match them, and I like that a lot, and then you forget how to speak English, and basically I became one of, one of them, and adopted their lifestyle, their everything, as mine. And so, this is the, the church group there, one of the main churches. Um, so in these different communities, there are churches in some places, but what, what is group projects? Group projects is a district. So here we have like several districts in the Wenatchee Valley, right? Where one pastor has like a church or two or three. Well, there, there is one pastor for the jungle. So we're talking about all the difficult to access places which include hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of communities. Just because they're not much happening present, so they can't give a pastor to all that place for them, apparently, something like that. So there are places where there are groups, but they are all start part of the same church, literally. And they all have one pastor. So how is that pastor supposed to do all that? Well, that's where the missionaries come in. They send people out two by two in these places, and we basically did the pastoral work. And then when there's a baptism or a something you call a pastor, you plan a date, and that day you do everything. You have the baby dedications, and the baptism, and the communion service, and the everything else that has to do, a pastor has to do, all in one day. And so, um, but that's the work that Proof Project does, and also they work with mediation to, um, uh, they do medical evacuations, and also to, there are some places that you can only get to basically by an airplane. Um, so that's something that was really cool to me when I got there. I realized that that group project was the same place that Clyde Peters started years ago. And he was the one who inspired me. I don't know if you can pilot the jungle line or what. So I'm not a pilot yet. But as I saw that God had, made, had brought me to the same place, I started to rethink it. Could it be they got an ice cold for that dream that I had as a child? And, well, so this year, um, we, we are the work we do, we do visitations. Here's some, some pictures of the picture. This is the, the team at Food Project this year. Um, and I was to say point. We did lots of visitation, visitations, Bible studies, prophecy seminars, different seminars, weeks of prayer, evangelistic series, um, Bible studies with the kids. Pathfinders with the youth there. Um, community um, service stuff. There they are. Putting in the yard and lady. Building churches. Um, it's you haul all the all the sand comes out of the river on your head and everyone pitches in. They're literally little kids who carry sand in a tiny little basket like this up from the river. And this is the finished product up until we left. So this is building our boat. And that's what we moved around it. So during this time, we experienced incredible miracles as God provided for us when we didn't have money. And we protected us from the land. Those miracles that we read about, like, he did all those incredible things for us. For us. I learned dependence on God. From there, I had nobody on earth on which to rely. There's not like you can just call a friend or something like that.
back. There's nobody. You're alone. But God is enough. I remember moments of desperation when I tramped into the bush with my machete and my Bible. I held up my two swords. My physical sword and my spiritual sword. And I remember going in there and opening my Bible where and pouring out my heart to God a lot.
like the problems her sister had and that she had, and honestly, I knew they were sick, but I didn't really know that much about, I couldn't understand enough to know what's really wrong, but I could spend time with them. And as I sat there thinking how I can reach out to her, I remember that on my phone, I had a recording of the book of John and she people. So I pulled it out, and I started playing the book of John and she people. And she's sitting there in her piano, and she started to listen. And as she listened, she, I could just see that in her mind, she was captivated by it. And we listened and we listened. I sat there trying to listen to, I loved trying to pick out the words that I could understand and stuff. And I remember just looking into her face and thinking, this is what it's all about. And I saw the joy that she had to hear the word of God. And when the chapter ended, she was like, we keep listening. And the time had kind of gone by and we couldn't in that moment. But she, she loved it. She couldn't read. She couldn't probably see very well. She didn't have anybody who was, could, she couldn't have any weight. She was hearing words that to her were life and that are to us life. And that is what it's all about. And then we, we sang together, we prayed together, and then she took me out back on their back step, and there was a, that she had a cook fire with boards and stuff around it. And on there she had chapel cooking on her fire. Chapel is a, um, it's made out of the platinum magu, the, the, the ripe plantains. You boil them and then you chop them up and drink it, and it, oh, it's so good. <laughs> but anyway, so she's there, she finds some little stick, and she starts chopping it up, and why they bare put her on the thing and she finds some, I don't know, they were clean, I didn't care, some cups from the shelf and we start drinking chocolate together and it was just these precious moments of sharing time with people that even if there's been barriers of language and communication, God's word and the love that he gives us can communicate across any barrier. He, he simply asks our time and our willingness to be able to focus on the small moments of every person. There was another experience one week that I spent in the community of Kukoyal. This was an Ashanika village that was the farthest village away. It was a, a trip by five hours farther by boat up the river on their little creek. And um, then this week we went there for, we were there for a couple of weeks. And during this time we didn't have a boat, so we were there, we were actually constructing our boat. So we did, they, they lived there with Part of them that lived in a village, others that lived far away, like half an hour walking through the jungle up that little hill, another two hours up the river over there, and just, they live all over the place in the jungle. So we spent that week walking. We had our, took our Bibles, my ukulele, a picture bowl, and a um, machete. And that's, we would tramp all over the place, hours a day. And we would sometimes go by river in boats, far boats. You did this. They call it Tangana. This is how you navigate the lower river with the poles. Um, we would go all over the place. Sometimes we got lost. <laughs> and, <laughs> but that week was an incredible experience for me because the people there also they don't speak Spanish very well. Most of them speak Chinese, which I didn't know how to speak very well either. And they, they literally don't know, they don't have any background with spiritual things. So, um, I spent in other villages, we would spend a lot of time doing Bible study, we use the faith in Jesus Bible studies, and I gave those out to me so many times that I had to practically memorize. Like, uh, it's a price. I would find it became mundane to do the same studies. But maybe what was the nature of Christ? How many God people in the God? And it's like, you see that I was like, Wait, this is not good actually because it doesn't matter how many times I go to these simple truths, they shouldn't become old for me ever. This week, it all crystallized for me as I spent time showing people from the picture rules and telling them the stories of Jesus. As they listened to the stories, I'm like, how oh, is the first time they ever heard these stories? And as I went telling them, I realized and knew the beauty of the love of Jesus and what he's done for us. And I remember one day specifically, we made it up, way up river to this one home, and there was a lady, um, she was sitting out by the river washing her clothes. So we sat down and started washing her clothes with her. And we washed and washed, and when it was all done, she stayed to bathe, and we, I took the, the, her big total clothes up to the, up on the hillside to her house. 
and I put them all out of mine, and they're just all, I think it was just, have just finished when she starts to come up from the river. And just then, the cords fell. Yeah. And all the clothes fell in the dirt. And I was like, oh, no, what's she going to do? Because it was in that same home that the year before when my mom and sister, they had a, a little gathering there, and there had been some guys that had wanted to, to shoot us with bow and arrow. But thankfully, another guy from out of the idea. But it was, I was not exactly, they, they had not, they don't, they did not accept me quickly there because of superstition. They have, they think that white people are all pelacaras, which they, <laughs> they think that, what are they, face, face peelers. They think that, um, that there's a lot of organ trafficking and things like that in that area. And, um, the, the sad part is that part of it, there are really bad things that really do happen. And so, some way it's like, well, I don't know, I'm like, I'm not one of those people, and I'm not going to do anything to you. But it, they took a long time to believe me. And that part of the time, for fear, they didn't want to accept us. And it had taken a long time. Finally, this woman had, had come to where she accepted us into her home. And where she, she was showing us she trusted us. And, but then this day, I'm up there, and I just knocked all of her clean laundry in the dirt. I'm like, what's she going to do now? Thank her, I started laughing and praying. And thankfully, she started laughing too. They're trying to just love to laugh, like big laughter. And so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go wash it right now. You can go wash it. So I start to gather up, stick it in the, the thing, and I go down the river, and I rinse all the clothes out again, fill up the bucket, go back up, and that time we tie the rope again. We, we test it, both of us, I'm like, I think it's going to break. I don't think so. Oh, no, no, it's not going to break. Put all the clothes back up, and then we're just ready to, to start um, studying with her a little bit. So we go up onto our house, onto our porch. We're sitting there with her, her children. We start to get a picture roll. We're starting to tell our stories. As we're telling our stories, all of a sudden, the rope snapped again. Oh. <laughs> and all the, the clothes in the dirt again. Like, oh, not now, right in the middle of this. And she's like, one day, get up. I'm like, no, you need to stay here and listen. But thank you, my wish. I'm like, no, I'll go wash her clothes this time. So she went off and washed the clothes. like, this time, it's going to drive on the walk. <laughs> so, while she was, my missionary partner was down washing clothes, I continued to tell this woman about Jesus. And it came to the picture of Jesus on the cross. And I was trying to use the most simple language, and their language, Paula, is Dio. It's God. <laughs> and so I'd be like, we would literally explain, Paula, he died down, Viva. Paula, he lives up, up there above. And then I'm trying to look, look what they did to Pawa. See how they, they nail in his hands, they put the, the, the nails in his hands, and they put him up on that cross, and they all beat him and stuff, and she's just looking at him. And then she looks at him and says, Why? 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 And it was in that moment that, it, that my mind just like stopped. And I realized she's never heard the story of Jesus. How do I explain to her in just a few moments? Why? Why Jesus had to die? She doesn't know where sin originated. She doesn't know that we're sinners. She doesn't know that we needed a savior. She doesn't know that Jesus is a God who came from heaven, who came here, who lived, who ministered, who died, so that she can be saved and so she can go to heaven. Like that is a story that I can tell you guys, sorry, in a few in a few moments, in a few words, and you get it. Because we've heard it all our lives. But she never heard it before. So I tried in just a few moments to explain to her the essence of what salvation is. And I, it was that that touched me so much because she's one of so many hundreds of people who literally don't know who Jesus is. They don't understand why he came to die for us. They don't know that he came, that he even came to die for us. And In my mind, I have etched the faces of so many people, of men and women, who live in the darkness of superstition and slavery to sin, and others who have lived there but have come to know the freedom that we have in the gospel, truly the good news of a Jesus who is light and who is love. And the faces of so many little children. If I told you their stories, 
it would make you cry. For the hard work that they've lived, and also for the tenacity they have for life. And it is through them that God has planted in my heart an even bigger thing. The image of a dark knight seated cross-legged in a circle on a dirty floor, watching the face of the dear girl who is more like my little sister. As the tears course down her cheeks, as she pours out her heart and her story. Then the image of an hour later, the child has gone from home and I have snuck outside under the stars. And as I gaze up at them, I picture the one who stands beyond them. And I think, Lord, please help me. Because I don't know what else I can do. And then, in that same prayer, I read, I will give my life for these kids. And I meant it. Since that night, my life has gained me purpose. It wasn't really just the work of one night, but that of an experience. It was more of an experience that confirmed what had been growing in my heart over the course of the months that I worked alongside these people. If God so led me, I would return to do something bigger, something more, something for the last of life. Since then, I've thought and prayed a lot about it. I've talked to other missionaries and the project director, and I've come back here, but I don't plan to stay. My dream is to finish the necessary education and go back and start having a school. In fact, one of my missionary companions is there this very year, beginning the first Adventist school in the Ukayali River region, in the lower Ukayali River. It'll be, the construction will happen this year, and classes should start next year. It's a project, he was inspired us on his own in a similar way to do the project, and this will be like the pilot project. They're advancing by faith, for they don't have a penny in their pockets. But when God calls us to do something, he asks us to simply move, and he will provide. So, the thing is that we don't just need one school, we need lots of schools. And my dream is to plant a school in the upper room. I look at the vast work to be done, and sometimes it seems like a hopeless case. There are so many needs. We need not just one or two schools, but many schools. We need funds. We need teachers. We need churches built. We need the airplane repairs. We need volunteers who will go as pioneers to the hundreds of villages that still don't speak the name of Jesus. There is a work for all to do, the neglect of which will cause the loss of precious souls. But more than that, we need a revival. We're all mixed up. I remember keeping the data that all this. Sacrifice is not about what we give up of material things. It's about giving up ourselves. I remember one day as I worked there, I, I, I thought to pour everything, every ounce of my energy, my strength, my life, into the work I was doing for those people. I prayed every day, Lord, help me to love them with all of my heart. I will work night and day, it doesn't matter. And yet, we're humans. And I knew I was human, I knew that many times I failed, many times my selfishness gets in the way, and I choose to do something I want to do instead of something I can do for someone else, or just, I don't know, or just that's the way we are. <laughs> but I remember as the, as the year drew to a close, thinking, how will I feel when the year is over? And I look back. Will I regret anything? Will I have thought, I wish I'd done more? I wish I'd done this, or I wish I'd done that? I don't want to end this year with regrets. And yet, I knew that even if I did everything I could in my strength, it wouldn't be enough. Because the only thing that can truly change lives is the Spirit of God. And I need to have His Spirit living and working in me. I need to be a person who prays, who works, who works praying because that is the only way that we can be obtainers of the power of God. And yet, that, that's where we come to our scripture. So let's open our Bibles again to Hebrews 12. And I think we're familiar, if we back up for context to Hebrews 11, it's the faith chapter, right? It tells of so many men and women who did incredible things for God. Not because they were incredible people, but because they were people like us, who trusted incredibly in God. And near the end of chapter 11, if we start reading there, it says in verse 32 that, And what more shall I say? 
He said there's not time to tell of all the people and the things they've done for God. And in verse 33 he says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, waxed um, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in flight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mocking and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not real. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And they all, having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. And then it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. These men are our witnesses. We, we're not, sometimes we feel like we're alone, like, like it's all about us, but we're simply another generation of the hundreds of thousands of people who have lived and given their lives and died for Jesus. It says, wherefore, seeing where comes from, so with the so grand of the witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us go with patience the race that set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down the right hand of the throne of God. Isn't that where we want to go to? For consider him did endure such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be weary and faint in your mind. The life, Christian life, is not necessarily easy. Sometimes we're tempted to become weary and faint in our minds and our hearts. But it says, in that moment, consider him who's run before us. And then it says, he has not yet resisted of his blood, striving against sin. What does it say we're striving against? Sin. Sin. It doesn't say that we're striving against governments, that we're striving against those bad neighbors, that we're striving against people who reject us or scorn us or anything like that. It says we're striving against sin. The battle is not without, the battle is within. And if we want to be conquerors in the Christian life, if we want to be true missionaries, the sacrifice is not to give up home, nor family, nor comfort. Maybe that will be part of it. To each one, God has given them all. But the real sacrifice is to give up ourselves. Because if we don't give up ourselves, it doesn't matter where we are, but where we work, we can never do And I love how it says we have not yet resisted unto blood. Can you think of someone who resisted unto blood?
my dream and stuff, but then I can see how God has replaced that. It wasn't, if he had told me to what he told me to now, three years ago, I would have been like, wait a minute. I don't think he'd get ready for this. But he didn't do it like that. He told me to take steps. And when we respond in every step, then he shows you the path of life, and in his presence is fullness of joy. And I believe, I don't have anything wrong. There's no problem with being a math major either. No offense to anyone. If you, if God has called you to be a math major, do it by all means. If he's called you to be an accountant or a nurse or a doctor or a mechanic, it doesn't matter. God calls us to every walk of life, to each person. The problem is when God has called you to something and you want to do something else, and you choose your way. But God has called every single one of us, every person, to be a missionary. To make of our calling, of our life, of our work, mission service. And in order to do that, every single one of us must fight the battle against self upon our knees. Friends, Jesus is coming very, very soon. I believe it with all my heart. But I believe that though we go, though we do many things, Jesus won't be, can't come until we have fought this battle in our own hearts and upon our knees. I think it's time to unite as a church family, as Christians, and pray like we've never prayed before. And to search our hearts and to pray, Lord, show me. Am I living the life you call me to live? Am I doing the work you've given me to do? I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I want him to lead me every step of the way. I'm willing to do whatever work he calls me to. But I know that I can in my own strength. And I know that God has called each and every one of you to a very special work and a very special place. And that if we are faithful unto death, he will give us the common life. But I want to invite each one of you to join me today. It doesn't matter. I'm sure, I know that each one of us has a testimony. You can look back on your lives, too, and see how God has led you. But let's not let today, let's not let the sun go down today before we fall on our knees and said, Lord, even if I was sure I was in the right spot, just tell me again. Let me know for sure where you want me in life. Guide me on your path. This world is not cold. It doesn't matter what I have here or what I don't have. That's nothing, because I'm down from heaven. And I want you to be Lord of my life, to have my whole heart, because as long as I'm holding on to some part of sin, I will be destroyed with it. But I want to be a seeker of heaven, and I want to take as many people I can with me. And that will only happen when you live 100% in my heart and life. Is that your guys' desire to join with me on this journey? And that is the power of his. Our Father in heaven, you are so good to us, Father. You have led each and every one of us up until this moment. And we know that you will be faithful until the end. We know that you've run the race before us. You've show us, shown us how it's to be done. And you've promised to run it again by each and one, every one of our sides, Father. You know that self is strong. The devil is strong. But Father, you are stronger. You've promised to give us the victory. We want to be missionaries for you. We want to use whatever we have, whether it be our time, our talents, our resources, here, abroad, wherever it may be, Father, we want to give them and dedicate them to you. And most of all, Father, we want to dedicate to you this morning our hearts, that you may live in our hearts 100%, Father. Thank you for your love for us, for your incredible patience with us, and for your mercy, and for your grace that not only is unmerited favor, but is also the power to become victorious over sin and the devil. I pray for every person that is here today, Father, that we may recommit our lives to you this day, and that we may run this race that you run before us. We may fix our eyes on Jesus, and that soon, Father, you may come again, and we will be united in heaven to live for all eternity. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.